Hello everyone, me again. Um, I'm here to make a little follow-up, a little response to my previous video in which I talked about uh, many things actually. I got a little carried away with myself. I started off talking about um, the idea of atheism as a religion and from there I got into gay rights and then I think I talked about a few other things. So. Uh, I went a little long and, you know, I kind of rambled uh, and went on a few tangents. Uh, I probably will this time as well. I'll try to keep it a little shorter this time. Um, this is not really a new video. This is mostly a, a direct response to, um, partly a, a response to the last video, especially to some comments that I received uh, in the last video. And I apologize again for the uh, awkward lighting. Uh, just, just because of the way things are positioned here in the room, it's kind of difficult for me to you know, uh, like sit here and put the camera up there and face that direction. That would make the lighting more even, but um, but then again, this whole Batman sort of two-faced look perhaps suits me. So anyway, um, first of all, I want to thank everyone for the responses that I got in the last video. They were mostly very constructive. I didn't get a lot of people posting uh, very negative or very hateful or disruptive comments, which I appreciate. Uh, as I predicted, of course, I didn't get a lot of views. I got only a few hundred views, which is not bad. I mean, you know, I I, um, I don't want to sound ungrateful. I mean, a hundred views is not bad, or, you know, a several hundred views is not bad. I mean, there are some videos which, you know, don't even get that many. So I think that um, it turned out fairly well. Uh, again, I know I said some things which might have been very pr provocative or um, controversial, so um, I, I was very pleased that uh, people gave some constructive feedback and to lend some constructive discussion. Uh, I want to respond directly to a couple of things. First of all, um, several people um, followed up and said that atheism is not a religion and that I might be attaching uh, some significance or some meaning to the idea of a religion which shouldn't be there. Uh, so I, I want to uh, stipulate again, you might want to, I don't mean to be snarky, but you might want to just check the title of the video. The, the video is not about why atheism is a religion. The video is specifically called Why Atheism, uh, Why Some People Say That Atheism Is a Religion, which is a completely different thing. I, I'm not advocating the idea that atheism is a religion. I understand that it is not. And in case I was ambiguous, uh, I'll say clearly atheism is not a religion. Of course it isn't in the most literal sense. It's not a belief in, you know, some deity. Um, but again, my point was just that some people say it is, and by way of explanation, I want to clarify that what they're talking about is the sort of, you know, the, the fervor and the, the zeal that it, uh, that it gives to atheists, because it's kind of reminiscent of, you know, some evangelical preacher or someone like that trying to, trying to press their views, trying to press their uh, point of view on someone else in a sort of, uh, a religiously, uh, fervent kind of fashion. So that's basically what, what I was getting at. And again, atheism is not a religion. I want, I want to make that clear. I'm not saying that it is. I'm just trying to explain. I just want to promote understanding because, you know, people have obviously different opinions. And my point with my last video was just to try to clarify uh, a stance that some other people have. Because I, I understand where they're coming from. I'm not necessarily taking their side or their stance, but I'm trying to exp explain other people's point of view because I think I understand a little bit why they say that and, you know, what they're trying to get at. So, you know, it's useful to, um, to be able to understand what other people say, even if you don't agree with them. You might not agree with other people, but I think that, um, I think that it is useful to be able to understand the, uh, the positions and the opinions of people you don't agree with. Um, I think there's an ancient Chinese proverb or, well, who knows if it really is, a lot of things which are attributed as being ancient Chinese proverbs really aren't, but there is um, something reputed to be an ancient Chinese proverb that says something like, um, the person who cannot agree with his enemy, uh, today that might be his or her enemy, you might make it a little more politically correct, but I'll, I'll just use the male pronoun to simplify. The person who cannot agree with his enemy is controlled by them. If you can't uh, if you're not able to agree with someone, it doesn't mean that you have to agree with them, but if you're not able to understand their point of view and see their point of view, then you're basically controlled by those people because you don't understand them, because you don't understand their perspective, you don't understand their point of view. 
That's a powerful idea, and I think there's some truth to that. I mean, it, you know, as with most proverbs, it's not an absolute truth. I mean, if you can't understand someone, it doesn't literally mean that they control <clears throat> that they control you, but um, it does mean that you're not able to see things from their view. It, it means they see something that you don't. So, you know, perspective is um, a powerful thing. I actually want to talk a little bit more about perspective, but I think I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, the second thing, there are two things I want to, uh, you know, say in direct response to my last video. The second thing is, um, I probably misrepresented the gay community, and I don't think anyone uh, accused me of that directly, but somebody suggested that I might be kind of picking out certain elements. And, you know, I kind of went back and watched the video uh, to make sure that I didn't say anything uh, that I shouldn't have said. And I think that uh, that's probably true. I probably uh, wasn't quite fair to the gay community in the sense that I represented them as, in their own way, hateful and bigoted and prejudiced. Um, I think that's true. I mean, I, I think that I... Um, I think that it's fair to say that some elements are that way, but it certainly is not fair to um, to say that as a group they're completely that way. I mean, of course it's not. It, you know, it becomes another stereotype. So I don't want to stereotype, uh, you know, gay, gay people or the gay community as being very angry or very hateful or anything like that. If I gave that impression, I apologize. I think I kind of owe an impre uh, impression, a, a, an apology. I owe an apology to the uh, to the gay community if I. Um, and I, to some extent I did, I sort of represented the one side of these people who are very abrasive, very aggressive, very, um, um, you know, obnoxious in how they advance their views. And, you know, I talked about the whole thing with Perez Hilton, and Perez Hilton, okay, he's, a, he's kind of a public figure, um, the whole thing with him and that beauty pageant, whatever, was very publicized. But, you know, it got blown out of proportion. Perez Hilton is one guy. Uh, so, you know, I want to clarify, Perez Hilton is one guy. He doesn't necessarily represent the whole gay community. He doesn't speak for an entire community of millions of people. So I, I wouldn't want to give the impression that I'm saying that all gay people are very angry or very aggressive about trying to force people to agree with them or anything like that. That's not the case. And if I gave that impression, then I apologize. So, I, like I said, I, I do owe an apology to anyone who... Um, might have gotten that impression that I, I'm trying to say that, uh, you know, all gay people are very uh, aggressively trying to get people to accept their position, because that's certainly not true. Um, but again, there are, you know, elements like that. Pettis Hilton is um, an example. He was, like I said, a very public example. I have met other people who are like that. So, you know, there are uh, gay people who become very angry and very um, intolerant if you don't agree with them because they, um, you know, they're convinced that their their view is right. Um, there are a couple of interesting news stories that uh, surfaced this, uh, well, last week. I'm filming this on a Monday, so both of these happened last week. But there are two interesting news stories that I wanted to just bring up briefly. Uh, one, just kind of a, a funny story about Paris Hilton, not Perez Hilton, the gossip columnist, but, you know, the original Paris Hilton, whom uh, the gossip columnist kind of styled himself after, or at least his name. Paris Hilton uh, uh, was in the news this, week, uh, this past week, this last week, because she um, made some very derogatory remarks about gay people and said, uh, she said something like... Uh, Oh, I would be really scared to be a gay person because you know, uh, you know, they're probably all going to die of AIDS or something like that. And you know, the, these remarks became very publicized, and so you know, there's there's a lot of um, there, there's a lot of ignorance on both sides. <laughs> People certainly say a lot of dumb things, and you know, you have Paris Hilton on the one hand, who's kind of like. Yeah. And then you have Perez Hilton on the other side, who's like, also, in, no. So, um, interesting contrasts. Uh, similar names, or at least names that they use publicly, but almost opposite sort of mentalities or awarenesses. So, uh, the other thing that I wanted to mention, though, a funny news story which kind of uh, dovetails well into what I was talking about. Um, there was an incident in Iran last week where, um, uh, as I understand it, and forgive me if I get the details wrong, but the basic story I know is true, because uh, you know, if, if you can believe the news, which I, I, I believe this is probably true, uh, I believe two young women were walking together uh, just down the street in Iran, and um, 
a cleric, an elderly sort of, you know, Iranian Muslim cleric, told them they should cover themselves. Iran is still, a, you know, um, a rather conservative country, obviously a Muslim country, and these women, you know, these were young women who were expected to be wearing, you know, a, a veil over their face to cover themselves, and they were not. And so this man simply told them, um, young ladies, you should cover yourselves. Um, they responded by telling him that he should avert his eyes. If you don't like it, you can just look somewhere else, just look away. And so he, uh, he reminded them again, um, I don't know exactly what wording he used, but he said, he claims that he worded it gently. He claims that he gently ad admonished them, young ladies, you, 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 should, you, should, you should be covered. Their response was to punch him out. And, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, like they literally physically punched this old man. And, you know, it would be different if, uh, if he was like a, a younger guy, if he was in his 30s or 40s, you might think a young woman uh, punching a, a grown man might not be a big, you know, might not hurt that much. But this was an older guy. This was an elderly, uh, you know, cleric in the, um, you know, in uh, the Muslim faith. So he was an old man and he went, he got knocked down, like they actually knocked him down by hitting him. And... You know, there we go. That's the story. I, I don't think I even need to comment too much on that. I, I think that sort of illustrates what I was talking about, that um, it's, you know, it's, it's okay to stick up for human rights. I mean, if you're a young woman uh, in a Muslim country, or, or even not in a Muslim country, or just, you know, talking to someone who says that you need to cover yourself, uh, you know, it's it's okay to say, well, I don't have to. It's okay to say to stand up for yourself and say, what if I don't want to? That that's fine. I mean, you don't you don't have to. Uh, well, I don't know what the laws are. Maybe in some places it's probably still mandated by law. But you know, okay, I'll I'll support the right of young women or older women or anyone to not have to cover themselves in public. That that's fine. But obviously, I don't think I even need to say it. But I'll just finish off by saying the obvious, it's, it's not okay to physically assault someone for telling you to cover yourself. That's not, uh, that's not an okay thing to do. So, you know, this is just kind of an example of what I'm talking about. We sort of get into this mentality, we sort of get this idea that we are the good guys. There's still sort of, you know, there's this human tendency to adopt this sort of us versus them mentality. There's this idea that, okay, we're the good guys, we're the good people, we're fighting for human rights, we're fighting for equality and fairness and justice, and those people are the enemy, and we can just attack them in whatever way we feel like because they're the bad guys, and it's okay to degrade them or hit them or call them names or you know just generally vilify them. It, it, it's not the case, it, folks. That's just it's not acceptable. I mean, they're humans. Those other people are human beings as well. They may disagree with you. Their ideas may be repugnant or you know based on uh, prejudice or uh, ignorance or whatever. Okay, but it's it's not okay to, to do something like that. Um, and while on the topic of human nature, I just wanted to make an observation. Um, I, I'm not a psychiatrist. I mean, you know, I didn't study psychology or anything like that. So this is just sort of my own personal perspective, my own personal view. But um, I have observed that there's a human tendency to always want to escalate something. When you get into a fight, there's always a human tendency to um, kind of, you know, ramp it up a notch. Um, and I was thinking recently about a news story that I read um, many years ago. I grew up in Toronto, Canada, and this, this happened in Toronto. I remember reading about, about it in the newspaper when I was uh, fairly young, like, you know, a young teenager. So this was a while ago, but um, uh, a gay man and his partner were walking down the street. And, you know, often uh, gay couples are a little uncomfortable about holding hands in public because they think that it might uh, you know, upset other, other people. Some people get upset by seeing gay couples holding hands, so whatever. But they were. So, you know, there were two gay men, a gay couple, they were holding hands walking down the street. And I guess it was fairly, you know, evident that they were partners. So there was a guy sitting uh, in his car. It was like, you know, I guess it was a convertible car. Or maybe the, uh, yeah, I think it was a convertible car. Maybe the window was just open. There was a guy sitting in a car parked on the, uh, by the side of the street. And as he saw these two, uh, you know, gay, as he saw this gay couple walking by, he said out loud, and I don't know if it was like directed at them or just said to someone else or in general, but he said loud enough that he was playing that he was saying it. Boy, there sure seem to be a lot of faggots around here. 
So that was step one. That, that was the, you know, the first problem. The reaction of one of the gay men was, uh, he was smoking a cigarette, so his reaction was to take out his lit cigarette and throw it into the car, which of course, you know, had the potential to set the upholstery on fire or at least cause some damage, probably cause, like, you know, a burn mark on the, the seat upholstery. That was step two, that was the second problem. The reaction of the person in the car, who had made the remark, was to get out of the car and beat up the gay couple. Or at least the guy who had thrown the cigarette. So that, that was step three, so that, that was kind of where it ended, and then of course, you know, it became a police case, the police were called out and the guy was charged with assault and all that. So I, I just, I find this an interesting story because notice how each side just uh, constantly felt the need to to go one farther. It started off with a comment, just a verbal comment, which was offensive, which was insulting. Yes, uh, it was uh, not a nice thing to say, not an appropriate thing to say. It was a wrong thing to say, but that was just words. The, uh, you know, the gay, uh, one, of, one of the gay men, his response was to take it to the physical. He threw a lit cigarette in such a way that it could have caused some kind of property damage, and it probably wouldn't have cost you know, obviously it wouldn't cost millions of dollars worth of damage, but it might have left like a singed toll in the car. That, that's taking it into the physical. That's escalating the situation. That's taking it beyond where it is and actually escalating it to a worse level. And then, of course, when the guy gets out and starts punching out someone else, then it's assault and then it just becomes a whole other matter. So th this is something that I often see in fights. Whenever you see people get into a fight, there's always this desire, there's always this sort of human tendency to escalate. You know, if, if you start off fighting at this level, then the, the next person to respond always wants to notch it up to this level, then the other person wants to notch it up higher than that, and it just goes up from there. That's, that's how things flare up. It, it starts off very simply, and then it just, there's, like I said, there's a human tendency to just want to, like, overwhelm the other person or kind of prove yourself stronger than the other person by attacking them more forcefully and more aggressively than they did. So, you know, this, this is what I consistently see happening. And, you know, it's, it, it's not okay. I mean, that's, that's, that's my whole point here. You know, I'm not trying to take the side, I'm not trying to take either side. I'm not trying to take the side of gay rights or of anti-gay rights. And I'm not trying to stand for traditional marriage or gay marriage. All I'm saying is that, um, you know, uh, conservative Christians are notorious for, um, for a lot of things. You know, they're uh, notorious for being hateful and spiteful and bigoted and intolerant. And all of that is true. But if the gay community wants the respect of the general public, if they want the support of, you know, people who aren't uh, gay or lesbian or bisexual or so on, they need to play fair. I'm just I'm speaking to the gay community now. You, you need to play fair. You need to play by the same rules that you expect other people to play by. It's okay to say that you shouldn't criticize me or, you know, uh, make incendiary remarks towards me. That's, that's a fair thing to say. But if you would like to foster that kind of environment, then you need to play by the same rules. You can't direct those types of comments at people whom you perceive to be your enemies, because you're not going to get a lot of support for that. You're not going to get a lot of, um, you know, you're, you're not going to garner support for that. And somebody said, uh, somebody made a comment in the last video that um, there's a lot of frustration, and the reason why a lot of gay people are so aggressive and so, um, you know, so uh, sort of uh, antagonistic in the way they defend their rights is because they're very frustrated with the lack of recognition among the general public about their, you know, their, their general lack of rights, their lack of equality in uh, most governments uh, around the world. And that's true. I mean, yes, it's, it's a reality that, you know, in most countries around the world, uh, gay couples still don't have equal rights with heterosexual couples. That's true. Uh, but you always make things worse by, um, you know, by, by lashing out at people. And I understand there's frustration, I understand there's a lot of, um, um, you know, suppressed sort of uh, anger and uh, resentment on both sides. And that's kind of the problem that we see, people are not, um, people are not getting results. In a lot of places, people have been campaigning for years for equal rights 
and yet all that campaigning, all that effort hasn't really gotten anywhere, and so they escalate, and so they keep kicking it up a notch, taking it a step further, until we have just openly ad hominem attacks, uh, physical assault um, on both sides. I mean, you know, you have, um, you know, like, like I said, I mean, it, it can happen from both sides. There can be uh, attacks from, you know, the supposed majority against the minority, or there, you can go the other way. I mean, in many places, there are places in the United States, for example, where um, uh, black people do assault white people for being white. There has been racially motivated, uh, there have been racially motivated attacks by African Americans against white people um, just, you know, for being white. So, you know, it's not that, uh, you know, it's, it's not unidirectional. It's not like one side only attacks the other side. It goes both ways. There's a lot of uh, resentment and a lot of anger on both sides. And that's our reality. But it doesn't, uh, it doesn't serve anyone to foster that. It doesn't serve either side's, um, uh, you know, goals to foster or promote um, anger or frustration or intolerance. So I just, you know, I just want to ask people, I want to ask both sides to play fair. Um, and, you know, speaking for myself, somebody may ask me, well, what's your position? I, I'm kind of staying out of it because uh, I don't really have a stand on it either way. Uh, somebody made a comment also in the last video, and I would kind of agree with this. They would say, why not do away with marriage altogether, at least as a government institution? Because people say that, you know, marriage is, um, and I, I hear this argument raised a lot with regard to gay marriage. Marriage is between two people, so why is it a question of the, why is it the government's concern? Why is it a political matter? And I think I would agree with that. I would advocate um, kind of doing away with, uh, with government recognized marriages altogether. Um, I'm not opposed to marriage per se in the, I'm not opposed to marriage in the sense of a, a long-term uh, relationship, a long-term monogamous relationship between two people. That's, you know, that's, that's fine. I've got nothing against that. But if it is, you know, a relationship between two people, why is it a political matter? Why is it a matter for the government? And so I think I would actually advocate, um, and I know there are reasons why this doesn't happen and probably won't happen anytime soon, but I, I probably would advocate, um, you know, a, a world in which marriage really is between the two people and there's no such thing as a marriage certificate or a marriage license. I mean, why do I need a piece of paper issued by some government office to approve of my relationship with another person. I, I shouldn't need that. I mean, it's, it is between the two people. Um, so you might say that that's sort of dodging the question. You might say, well, okay, maybe marriage as a government institution shouldn't exist, but since it does, uh, since it is recognized for uh, heterosexual couples, shouldn't it also be recognized for gay couples? Uh, okay, sure, whatever, but I, I would say in a larger sense, we should probably do away with government recognized marriage altogether because it is not, I don't see why it is a governmental concern. And then there are things like, okay, there's, uh, you know, there are tax reasons. Uh, you know, people often bring up that there are tax credits that go to married couples, which uh, to me is kind of like, why? I mean, it shouldn't be that way. Why should you get a tax break for being married? That's, that's also kind of a problem. That should, that then points to possible reform in the tax code that should, uh, that, you know, that could be justified, but um, whatever. So, you know, I, I, I want to clarify, I'm not, I'm not trying to take one side or the other. I actually don't really have a strong stance either way, because if I had my way, I would just say, look, marriage is between people. It's a personal thing. Uh, I don't see why governments should issue a piece of paper to certify, okay, now you're, uh, you know, now you're married to each other. Um, I know some people will disagree with that. That's, that's fine. Um, it's not something I feel very strongly about. Quite honestly, it's not something that I have very strong opinions about either way. And so it's kind of, it, in a sense, it's funny that I'm making a video about it since um, it's not something I feel strongly about. But then again, maybe that makes me a good person to make a video about it because since I don't have very strong opinions about it, I can be a little more moderate. And like I said, I, I watched my last video and, um, you know, after I'd uploaded it, I watched it again to make sure that I wasn't out of line or that I didn't say anything inappropriate or that I should rectify. And um, if, if I do say so myself, I think I was mostly pretty fair. I think, um, I think uh, I'll stand by everything that I said in the last video. I think that the things I said were fair and, you know, that, 
you know, I wasn't um, stepping out of reasonable bounds to say them. Um, and I'm, that's what I'm trying to be. I'm, I'm trying to be fair. I'm not trying to take to advocate either side. I am not on either side. I'm just trying to be a moderator. I'm just trying to ask both people to uh, both you know both sides, both viewpoints to please play fair. Uh, the golden rule still applies: do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you would like to be treated with respect, please also treat other people with respect, even if they don't agree with you, even if even if you feel like they're an enemy or you know your personal or political opponent. Please treat people with respect, and they're more likely to treat you with respect. That's just, that's how it goes. So, um, what else? I wanted to, I know there were a couple of other things I wanted to respond to as well. Uh, okay. Um, one thing also that, um, yeah, okay, a couple of things. So somebody said that I was picking out, uh, you know, only certain elements of the gay community, that I was kind of focusing on a, uh, on a group that was promoting hate, which doesn't represent the larger community. And I already addressed that. I said that, yes, the, the larger gay community is not people like Perez Hilton. They're not necessarily just, just making constant abusive remarks against their detractors. Um, but one thing I want to add also is that, um, well, I don't see a lot of people necessarily actively making negative remarks from the gay community. There's a certain sort of sense of, um, um, I think if you ask most people in the gay community about the whole uh, thing that Perez Hilton said, um, they would kind of, in, in reference to Carrie Preji and the woman who, um, who said that she believes in traditional marriage, they would kind of say, well, she got what she deserved. So basically, again, it's, it's like saying, uh, well, Perez Hilton maybe shouldn't have said that, but he was right, so really I'm on his side uh, and I'll, you know, I'll excuse it because, um, because what he said was true, even if, uh, even if he didn't say it in a very, you know, very polite way. Um, okay, uh, I understand that viewpoint. I just want to add that... Um, um, and this is a very important thing, which I think most people will uh, intuitively recognize as soon as I mention it. Uh, passiveness, um, basically inactivity or unresponsiveness, is enabling. And a very famous example of that, of course, was um, the situation in World War II. That was, I think, that's... I don't... I, I'm trying to avoid uh, analogies that use Nazis and the Holocaust in World War II because of, you know, Godwin's law and it's, it's overused and all that, but uh, when people talk about that, the thing that first comes to mind is World War II, and we say that the, the reason why the Nazis were able to do what they do in World War II wasn't so much because everyday German people supported the Nazis as just that they were indifferent to it. And here in Germany, I'm filming this here in Berlin, um, you know, here in Germany, we're often reminded of that, that it was not uh, necessarily that the, you know, everyday German people supported the Nazi party and supported the, you know, the invasion of Poland and France and basically, you know, almost all of Europe. And it's not that they supported the imprisonings of the, the Jews and putting them in concentration camps and all that. It was just that they, they tolerated it. They sat by and allowed it to happen, and they didn't, you know, speak out against injustice. They didn't sort of uh, say, uh, you know, hey, this isn't right. They were just sort of apathetic and kind of passive about it. And so again, you know, inactivity is enabling. It is an enabler. Inactivity in the face of hate, or uh, you know, any 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 bad thing. Inactivity or apathy towards any negative thing enables it to continue, even if. Uh, even if you don't agree with it, if you just sort of, uh, you know, tacitly or quietly support it, that still enables it to continue. So that's uh, something to kind of bear in mind. And, you know, you have to choose your battles. I mean, the reality is that uh, we live in a world where injustices take place every day. Um, you know, I mean, I don't even read the news that much, but uh, I do keep up with at least some of the major news stories. and. We see injustice in the newspapers every day. Of course, there is injustice that happens all around the world every single day. That's a reality. And 
you know, there are so many causes uh, on a lot of university campuses. You know, there are constantly people asking, hey, will you sign my petition uh, to address injustice in Tibet or, you know, Rwanda or some place like that? Hey, do you want to join this community group that's trying to fight uh, human trafficking or something like that? There are so many causes and so many different avenues for, um, for, uh, activism and things like that, that it gets a little bit overwhelming. So I think one of the problems that we have, that we tend to have as people, is that uh, there are so many things going on in the world, there are so many problems that we see, that we don't even know where to start. And so we just sort of step back and allow it to happen because we're so overwhelmed with this constant deluge of this injustice and that injustice, and in this country, which most people couldn't even find on the map, there's some civil war that broke out, and in that country, gay marriage is still not legal, and oh no, it's terrible, and in this country, some woman was uh, was raped because, you know, it's allowed there, and in some other place, somebody said something they shouldn't have said, and oh my goodness, it's just so overwhelming that we just, we, we can't even deal with it, we just say, I, I can't get involved with that, you know, what am I going to do about that, so... That's true. I mean, you know, one person isn't going to save the world. You or I personally can't just turn all this around and say, hey, you know, let's let's fix the whole planet. Um, but when you see it, I mean, when you see something that uh, that shouldn't be, there's there's a moment, there, there's a time and a place to kind of stand up for what's right. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of an art. It's kind of an art to um, be able to talk to people and tell people... Um, um, you know, uh, what's, what, what, what they should do. And, you know, there's another archetype, there's another whole stereotype in, uh, in, you know, contemporary sort of American society, you know, kind of liberal, enlightened society, that, uh, as soon as somebody says something that's offensive, right away there will be some wet blanket who will say, that's racist, or that, you know, that's discriminatory, that's offensive, you shouldn't say that. And, um... And I don't know that that really serves their purposes either, because that then kind of earns, um, you know, uh, earns these people a, a reputation as being very, um, you know, like, like they have a chip on their shoulder, like they're just waiting for someone to say something that could be perceived as racist or something like that, and they'll just say, hey, you shouldn't say that, you know, that's that's bad. So it's, it's partly about picking your battles. I mean, I have... Uh, had people say things which were offensive to me and I've just kind of shrugged it off because if it's just a joke or something You know some people don't like offensive humor um, I'm generally okay with it. if It's just a joke I mean, I've made some offensive jokes myself and I think it's okay as long as it's all just in a, you know in a spirit of, of fun and all that um, you know, political correctness, a lot of people don't like political correctness in the sense that you have to so carefully watch every word you say, and I don't want to foster that kind of atmosphere either, so, you know, I'm not encouraging people to be like these sort of vigilant watchdogs, just waiting for someone to say something that could be perceived as homophobic so that you can say, no, don't say that, that's, that's wrong. So, it's like I said, you have to choose your battles, you have to, you, you want to kind of, um, give people a little room to express themselves, a little bit of room to horse around and, and you know, tell their jokes or whatever, um, but only allow it to go so far. I mean, another, you know, I, I talked about people always escalating. It happens with jokes as well. There's always some group of people who start to tell a joke which is kind of offensive, and then somebody has to go at one better and say something that's even more offensive, and then, you know, just ratchets up from there. And it's all meant to be in good fun, it's all meant to be in good humor, but it can get completely out of control. So, you know, you kind of have to... There's this, you know, there's this sense of moderation, there's this sense of, okay, a, a joke can only go so far. A joke can go so far before it just, it's not funny anymore, it just is being taken too far. And, um... Everybody has their own, uh, you know, their own point where they draw the line. You know, one person might draw the line here, another person might draw it here. And so that's where different sensibilities get mixed up. One person might think that something's offensive, another person might say, hey, lighten up, it's just a joke. So I try to, uh, and I, you know, again, I'm trying to promote understanding. I'm not, this isn't really my opinion, I'm not trying to uh, get anyone to think my way. I'm just encouraging people to be more understanding. And, you know, if somebody says something offensive, 
you know, maybe think about it. I mean, was it meant to be a joke? Was it just sort of an offhand remark? Could it have been misinterpreted? Could it have just been, you know, just a, a casual thing? Maybe it wasn't really what I thought it was. Um, and, you know, if, if somebody says something that really makes you uncomfortable, that really hurts your feelings or upsets you or insults you, it's okay to say, uh, I'm sorry, but that's not funny. Uh, you know, I, I don't, uh, I gotta tell you, I'm not okay with that. I, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't say stuff like that. That's okay to say. But, you know, if, um, if somebody just, just makes like a, you know, a short joke or whatever, um, you wanna, at least in my mind, you wanna give people a little bit of room, a little bit of room to express themselves and kind of joke around and kid around and, um, you know, say what they have to say. Otherwise, then you sort of develop this reputation as, as some kind of, uh, as, you know, a, a different type of, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, politically correct um, Nazi, so to speak. Not not like an actual Nazi, but you know, like like one of these people who insists that everything people say is is correct and proper, and you can't say anything that's out of line. That, I mean, that's not a society I want to live in either. So you know, that's where terms like feminazi come from. Um, you know, it's. I mean, I, I consider myself a feminist. I don't uh, I don't want women to be discriminated against either, but. Um, I would be lying if I said that I had never made a joke at the expense of women. Not because I have anything against women, not because I, I think that women shouldn't be equal to men, but you don't want to be completely, uh, you know, completely cold about it. I, or at least I don't. I don't want to be completely politically correct. I think that it's okay to poke fun at people as long as it is all in good fun and doesn't cross the line into hate. And that's a fine line. Sometimes it's difficult to know where the line gets crossed, and that's the case, but, you know. I just want to encourage people to try to be respectful of others when you talk, try to be respectful of others when you listen, and if somebody says something that you don't like, uh, try to understand it from their point of view, and if you really don't like it, if it really upsets you, you can tell them. You can tell them, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't appreciate what you said. I'd like to, uh, to ask you to, uh, you know, be careful and kind of consider what you say. I think that's, that's fair to say, you know. If, uh, I've, I've been in that situation. I, I mean, I've had people do things to me that I wasn't comfortable with, and I said, I, I you know, I, I, I'm not okay with that. I got to tell you, I'm not okay with what's what's going on. That's fair. I think that's fair to say. Um, and one thing, I think, probably the last major point that I wanted to make was about uncertainty. Um, I talked a bit about certainty in the the last video, and. I got to say, I'm one of, I think I personally am one of the most uncertain people that I know. Um, and what I mean by that is just that I'm very, um, or at least to my mind, I, I perceive myself, this is my image of myself, I perceive myself as being willing to change how I think and change how I see things. Um, and not very, uh, you know, not very rigid or very like, you know, I believe this and I will defend this belief against all uh, oppressors who might seek to question it because this this is what I believe and this is what I stand for. I don't see it that I don't see a lot of things that way because um, the reality is that we are very uncertain people. Human life uh, is inherently uncertain. Uncertainty is an inherent part of human life, and um, and somebody posted a comment about first principles which I think is a great point to make, actually. Uh, it's kind of fundamental in our lives that we need to base our, uh, our beliefs on, on something. I mean, you, you kind of have to believe in something. Um, an example of that was um, kind of taken from science. Um, I'm going to talk science for a bit. Uh, not, you know, particularly advanced science, but when I was studying electrical engineering in college, um, in my first class, in my first electrical engineering class, the first thing that we studied was um, uh, atom physics. So, so we basically learned about neutrons, protons, and electrons. And most people know about that stuff, but you know, it's you know first topic, basic review of what you should know, and if you don't, we'll teach it now. So you know, you have an atom, and at the center of that atom, there's a very pa densely packed uh, mass of protons and neutrons, and then you have electrons that orbit around it. That's uh, kind of a first principle. Also, the first principle is the idea that an electron has the same charge as a proton, but they're opposite to each other. 
that's something you just have to kind of accept. If you're an electrical engineer, you have to accept that an electron is the exact opposite of a proton in terms of how much charge they have. Why is it that way? I don't know. I can't tell you. Now, if you really study about protons and electrons, you start to understand that they're not fundamental particles. They're made of quarks. And so a neutron has... Um, I don't remember the mixtures. It's like... So, you know, there's like up quarks and down quarks, and so you have two up quarks and one down quark, and that gives you a proton or a neutron, and vice versa is the other way around. I haven't memorized all the recipes and all the different ways that you can mix up the quarks, uh, but, you know, a, a proton is not like um, a fundamental thing. Uh, thousands of years ago, actually, uh, I think it was the Greeks who came up with the idea uh, that everything is made up of some fundamental particle, and they actually called them atoms. Uh, which is, you know, kind of interesting. So, you know, this idea of, of tiny little particles making up everything is not a... It's something that only recently has been scientifically, you know, given some basis, but even thousands of years ago it was an idea that the Greeks came up with, and it might have been believed in by some culture before that. But um, today we know that even, even though we have these things we call atoms, uh, they're not fundamental. There are actually 200 types of atoms uh, that we know of. I mean, um, Basically, an atom is a piece of an element, and in the you know the periodic table of elements, there are like two hundred elements that are known, and there's not even just uh, that's just the different numbers of protons. An element is categorized by how many protons its atom has, and um, then you get different behaviors if you have ions, an ion being you know an atom which is missing an electron or or has an extra electron, or um, you know, different numbers of neutrons. Neutrons are electrically neutral. They have no charge. <clears throat> Excuse me, no charge. And yet, if you, um, you know, if you have, uh, like, I think it's a uranium, a uranium atom with a certain number of neutrons, that enables nuclear fission to happen. So it's not even anything to do with the charges. It's just how many neutrons you've got there. So, you know, there are there are many many different types of atoms. They're not fundamental. And even electrons, protons, and neutrons are not fundamental. Those are also made up of yet smaller things. And we don't really know why those things are. I mean, we don't really know how those things work. I mean, can you tell me why do quarks exist? Or where did quarks come from? And how, you know, how did quarks develop? Well, it's not a question any scientist can, It's not a question anyone can answer. Nobody knows that. It's just something that, uh, you know, we kind of have studied and we kind of say, okay, there are these things that we've studied that we're aware of, but we don't know where they came from or how they work. So when you're an electrical engineer, you study about protons, atoms, and, and neutrons, um, protons, electrons, and neutrons, and that's pretty much it. That's about as far as you go. You don't need to understand quarks as an engineer, and so I didn't study it. I just, uh, you know, casually on my own time read about it, but I didn't study it in college. That's more a thing for, you know, physics for like pure science um, and even if you did study you wouldn't really understand how it works I mean like I said nobody understands how quarks work so that's an example of first principles you just have to accept when you're working with electricity you have to accept that you've got a proton which has exactly the same charge as an electron and if you ask why why are, why are their charges exactly the same? I don't know. Nobody knows. I mean, we, we can't answer these questions. You just have to take that as a first principle. You have to take that as something that we know. You have to accept that as kind of a foundation, a basis to start from. And, you know, you can develop knowledge from there. You can develop up from there and build on that, but you can't drill down below that and explain why does that happen, because we just don't know why that happens. Um, I'm sorry, it's a little dark. There's actually kind of a a thunderstorm that's been going on today, so the lighting in here is probably not uh, not the not the best. Um, okay. I hope that uh, I hope that I don't look too strange, um, or that the quality of the video isn't too off-putting. It's kind of dark outside because there's like a big black cloud passing overhead. Anyway, so <clears throat> so. That's an example of first principles. You have to just accept that, okay, there are these things which we, we kind of know what they do, but we can't explain how they work. We just know that they do. 
Uh, and there are a lot of things like this. I mean, basically everything in science is like that when you get down to the basics. Um, a lot of you might remember um, that, you know, Miracles by the Insane Clown Posse, which became uh, famous for lines like, How do magnets work? Magnets, how do they work? And I remember a lot of people mocking it and saying, Come on, man, are, are these guys just idiots? Don't we know how magnets work? But... We really don't. I mean, that's the thing. You know, you can. There's been a lot of study about magnets, and okay, I know that uh, you know a magnet has a field. There's, you know, you've probably seen diagrams of this magnetic field that develops around a magnet, and you can say that you know, there, you know, you have two opposite poles, and like, okay, metallic objects are attracted to it. All oh, that's fine, but why? Why does a magnetic object create a magnetic field? And okay, it's it's also because all the the atoms are aligned, right? I mean. I, you know, forgive me, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of ignorant myself, but I believe the way it works is all the atoms are lined up in a certain direction. And so because they're all lined up along one axis that creates magnetism, okay, fine, but, but again, why? How does that work? Like, why does it work that way? And, you know, if you ask why, if you drill down fundamentally and ask why to everything, eventually you'll not be able to come up with an answer. Nobody can... Uh, this is sort of, this is a basic philosophical concept. You can ask why to anything, and by saying why, you can make everything irrational. Um, you know, you can ask somebody, uh, well, why do you do this? Like, why do you, why do you bother going to work? If you don't like your job, why do you bother going to work? Well, because I need to make money. And then if you question that, you say, why? Wh why do you need to make money? Well, because I, I need money to, to eat. Food costs money, so I, I, I need to get food. Then you might say, well, why do you need to get food? What, can't you just not buy food? Why do you need food to live? I mean, you know, obviously people will die without eating food. And then you can say, why do that? Why do you need to live? You can just die. I mean, why do you need your life? And then people might say, oh, well, I, you know, I, I want to live because I have a family and, you know, I enjoy life or something like that. And they can say, well, why? I mean, why, why do you enjoy life? Can you give me a reason why you should live for your family or whatever? And then people will just say, well, you know, I, it's just... I don't have a reason, it just, I, you know, I, I want to. So everything that we do is ultimately irrational. Everything is really, um, there's no um, logical, rational basis for everything. Ultimately, everything is sort of predicated on values and ideas. Um, I think... I think it was David Hume. Da David Hume was a, a philosopher known for his um, advancement of skepticism in our uh, understanding of things. And I think Hume said something like, the act of eating food is inherently irrational because you have never died of starvation. I think all of you, I think everyone I'm talking to now can agree with me, none of you have ever died of starvation before. So how do you know that you personally would die if you didn't eat? Maybe it happens to other people. Maybe you're some kind of superhero. You know, sometimes people are born with strange sort of abilities or capacities. How, how do you know for a fact, with certainty, that you would die if you did not eat? Can you prove that? Obviously you can't because you didn't try it. So, you know, obviously you haven't died of not eating. So Hume acknowledged that... Um, Eating is inherently irrational because we have no basis for it. And Hume uh, insisted, which, you know, and there's some truth to this idea, that whatever you do, um, you can't necessarily expect to be repeated. Uh, there are some things which we've seen happen time and time again, and yet which, um, which may suddenly change, at, at, you know, change very quickly. Uh, for example, Hume, uh, I think he used the example of the sun. He said, every day that you've ever lived, the sun has come up. But that doesn't mean the sun will come up tomorrow. You can't prove that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Just because you've seen it rise every other day, that's not proof of anything. Um, a, more, a more relevant example, an example that I find is, is actually quite, uh, quite illustrative, is the idea of wearing a seatbelt. You know, I've known a lot of people who don't wear seatbelts when they drive. And, you know, I might say to them, um, aren't you worried? I mean, don't you think that if you get into an accident, your seatbelt might help? And they just say, well, you know, I don't care. I mean, what, you know, what's going to happen? I've never had an accident. 
And so, of course, what usually ends up happening to those people is they may drive for a long time, they may drive for 10 or 20 years and not have an accident, and then finally they'll have a serious accident, in which case they may, you know, they may die or suffer serious head injuries, which could have been avoided if they were wearing their seatbelt. So, you know, you might be driving perfectly for 10 years without an accident, without any problems, and then suddenly just one day have an accident in which you uh, break your skull or something because you weren't wearing your seatbelt. So the fact that you drove without a seatbelt for 10 years or 20 years without a problem doesn't mean that you might not have a serious accident tomorrow. So um, that sort of uncertainty, that sort of principle that we don't know what's going to happen. Um, in fact, we don't, we don't even really know what's happening right now. I mean, the truth is that, you know, forget about, people say that hindsight is twenty twenty, but it really isn't. I mean, how do we know that all the things we read about in history books are true? Often history is sort of um, not necessarily deliberately forged, but at least kind of, you know, misunderstood. A lot of people will record things in history that aren't historically accurate. And the future, of course, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. But forget about the past and the future. A lot, you know, we don't, a lot of the time we don't even really understand what's happening right now. I mean, can you really tell me what's going on in, um, you know, the government of some some country. I mean, what what really happened on 9-11? Well, you know, who was really behind 9-11? And there's all these conspiracy theories. And conspiracy theories are often just theories. They're often just, uh, you know, people being silly. But sometimes they're quite real. There, there are, there have been actual conspiracies. And sometimes they're discovered and then people find them out and say, oh, wow, this, uh, this whole conspiracy was going on. And sometimes they're not true and sometimes we'll never know. So that's something that, uh, that I accept, and I, I kind of accept the idea in my life that, um, <clears throat> that um, I can't really be sure. I mean, I can't really be sure of what's happening to me even right now, let alone what's happened in the past or what's going to happen in the future. Plato used the analogy of, uh, you know, Plato, uh, probably this is one of the most famous philosophical ideas ever, the idea of Plato's cave. Plato used the idea of people living in a cave and looking at like the, the back wall of the cave and seeing nothing but the shadows of people walking around outside the cave. So Plato basically said, we're like those, pe those people in a cave. We see the shadows of things that are going on, but we don't really see the reality. We don't really see what's actually going on. And it's very true. I mean, you know, our five senses, we have sight and sound, taste, touch, and smell, and these are the things that we use to look at the world uh, and to get information about the world. But who's to say that they're perfectly reliable? How can, how can we be certain that the things that we see are real? I mean, to a certain extent, we can't. We, we know with reasonable certainty that some of the things we've seen are not real. And then there are some things which we see which we, you know, could be real, but how can we really prove it? I mean, we can't. That's, uh, that's probably the fundamental philosophical idea. That I think the most fundamental idea of philosophy is this idea of uncertainty, this idea that we need to kind of use our heads and kind of, you know, kind of think about it. If, you know, people talk about the sixth sense, and the sixth sense is just kind of like your, your brain, I guess, your thinking or your intuition. And you, can't, you have to realize, again, this, this is just, you know, my, me speaking, this is kind of my personal feeling on it, I feel like we need to realize that we can't be certain about anything because everything is um, potentially just our perception. Um, and yet, having said that then, going back to the idea of first principles, first principles are the idea that we have to accept something. I mean, if you say that... Um, well, I don't know if, uh, if I'll die if I don't eat, so I'm going to stop eating and see what happens, then, well, you might die or you might not, but I, I wouldn't try it. I mean, I personally obviously haven't tried it. I still eat. Um, you can say, well, you know, theoretically you could do anything. I mean, you could jump off a bridge and say, well, how do I know I'm going to die when I hit the bottom? You could set yourself on fire and say, how do I know it's going to hurt or that I'm going to get, you know, get injured? So. Okay, you know, you don't want to be completely ridiculous about it, but then again, the question becomes, what's ridiculous? How do you decide what's ridiculous and what's not? In a certain sense, everything is uh, 
potentially ridiculous or potentially meaningful. Um, I think I said in the last video, I said that not everything is true. Uh, there is a philosophical ideology or idea called, I think it's just called trivialism. Is that right? I think, I think there's an idea called trivialism, which is the idea that literally everything is true. I could say one plus one equals 15 trillion, and it's true because it's an idea. Every idea is true. Um, and you can't prove that it's not. I mean, we can't prove that these ideas aren't true. So, so I, I did once have somebody tell me, I was kind of saying something like this to another person, and this person said, but you can't live like that. You can't live um, with the idea that things are uncertain because then you couldn't do anything. There's a certain truth to that, but at the same time, I think that it's fair. I think that people are able to say, um, I'll live my life and do what seems like the most sensible thing to me, but at the same time accept that it might not be true. Did I explain that very well? Let me, let me try to, let me try to, um, I apologize. I know I'm saying a lot and I'm kind of 